Okay, everybody, good morning. Okay, here we go. Good morning as we go to the Ram, to the Chumash of the day. Okay, we continue in Pashas Balak. Balak is the story of Bilam. Bilam okay, was hired by Balak to curse the Jews, and he's actually, in the first yesterday, he starts to give them their blessings. And we're holding a chapter 23, verse number 13. So Balak said to him, Let us come, come with me, and we'll go to another place. I said to a different place. I said, Over here, you're going to see, over here, you don't see the, the, this, this, the whole, this whole nation. We're going to come to a different place. You'll be able to see the, you'll be able to see a bigger part of the nation. Maybe you'll curse them from there. Verse 14, he took him to the field of the lookouts. To the peak of the mountain. And again, built seven altars. And he brought a bull and a ram on each of these, these altars. Rashi says, the field of the outlooks there was a high spot for where a lookout stands in guard for those that come to the city. Verse, the next, Reisha Piska, Bilam was not a great, not as great as diviner. Balak was a big uh, sorcerer. Balak foresaw that the breach was destined to break to Israel from there. Balak saw later the Jewish people are going to sin in this place. And indeed, Moshe died there. He thought that the curse could affect. So Balak was also. Balak was also as a sorcerer as Bilam. Bilam had a certain power. That's why Balak hired him. But Balak himself was this guy who knew magic and saw things in the mazolis and the stars. So he saw something that was going to happen in this situation. And he didn't, he didn't understand exactly, but he had some kind of intuition that something would be happen through seeing this situation. And he thought that maybe Bilam will be able to tap into it. So he said to Balak, he said, stay over here. Stay over here on your sacrifices. And I will chance. I'll go to see what happened. And she said, I'll go see what the game says. And the Lord chants upon Bilam. And he put the words in his mouth. I want you to go back to Balak and I want you to tell him exactly these words. That I said, what's meant by placing by Yasam Dvarab is his expression. So what is it meant by placing? What would the scripture have lacked? It simply said, return to Balak and he shall speak. What does it mean? He placed it in his mouth. However, when he Bilam heard that he was not permitted to curse, he said, why should we turn to Balak of Sam? I'm going to go home. I'll sneak out of here and get out of here. The old one blessed me. He put a, br- a brittle in the, in, the, in, the, in the and a bit in his mouth. He like made him like a, like an ox, you know, that has a that has like a nose in the ring. He said no. He put this. He put him. He slapped him. Dragged him to to say what he's supposed to say. Oh, bless. He put a brittle. So to to speak as a man who goads his beast with a bit. To lead him wherever he wants. He got said to him, you shall return to God against your will. I think Bilam wanted it. Bilam wanted to say all these blessings. He had no interest, as we know, that actually in his mind he was thinking everything as a curse. Verse 17, love. So he came to him, was standing next to his offering. He saw the Mayavita and the mat and the and the dignitaries of Maya with him with him. So Balak turned to him and said, what did God say? So now she says, over here it says, the ministers, the dignitaries. In the previous verse, it said, all the dignitaries. Why would he say dignitaries? Why not all the dignitaries? Because as it was going on, even the dignitaries started to lose interest. They realized that this was a lost case. What did the Lord speak? There's an expression denoting the Tzloikuzah. Uh, that he was making fun of him. Balak was making fun of, of Bilam, saying, okay, what are, like, who are you? You're like nothing. 
let's hear what the Abish just said, because you you basically have no you have no power. Verse 18. Isa Mashallah, so he started up his parable and he said, Kum Balak. Stand up, Balak. Shama Hazina Adi Vinait Sipa. Listen closely to me, the son of Sipa. And as she says, since he saw it, he started to mock him. He intended to taunt him. Stand up by your feet. You have the right to sit. For I've been sent to you by, by God. So stand up. Show respect. Vinait Sipa, you're the son of a Sipa. This uses the verb in the biblical style as in beast. And the beast of the earth. It's a grammar. It's a teaching us the, the concept of in, in, the, in the grammar of the night sip of the book. Like Ishael, verse 19, like Ishael, the Achsev of Ben Adam, Yisnachem. God is not a man that he should that he should lie, nor is he a mortal that he should relent. Would he say and not do? And speak and not fulfill? Now she says he's already promised them to bring them and to give them the possession of the land of the seven nations. And you expect to kill them in the desert? You're barking up the wrong tree. Would he say, this is like an expression of a question, would he say something and not do it? The tiger ultimately renders who later relents. They consider, reconsider and change their mind. The Abish doesn't change his mind. Verse 20, he barich lakachti, u barich valiashi better. I received an instruction to bless, and he blessed, and I can't retract. So now she says, You asked me what God to, what God, what did God speak? His answer is to receive from him instructions to bless them. And he blessed them, and I cannot retract it. He has blessed them, and I will not retract his blessings. Next, Tashi's grammar. Let's continue to verse number 21. He does not look at evil on, on Jacob. But it all on Israel and is not perverse, and you don't see the negatives of Jews. Hashem Alekavim, God the Lord, his God is with him. Who threw us Malachi, and he has king's friendships. Friendship. Now she says, "What well, means he does not seek to look at the evil of Jacob according to Tiger? Uncle is, means is I have looked. There's no idols and worship in Jacob. I don't see idol worship in Jacob. Another interpretation it literally means its literal meaning can be expounded beautifully. The Holy One, blessed be He, does not look at evil in Jacob when they transgress His word." He does not deal punctuously with them to scrutinize their wicked deeds and their iniquity in violation of. He doesn't go after every. He doesn't. He doesn't uh, accentuate their negative. Amel lashon aveda. Amel is the concept of transgression, mischief. Amel. He doesn't see the mischief. Of the Jews. Hashem Alekavim, the Lord of God is with him, even if they anger him and rebel against him, he does not move from their midst. Through us, And he has king's friendships through an expression donating love and friendship. They they are friends of God. Verse 22, El Mitim and Mitzrayim. God has brought them out of Egypt. You say for the same lie and the strength of his loftiness. Now she says, What does it mean God has taken them out of Egypt? You said, Behold, the people coming out of Egypt. They did not come out of Egypt themselves. Coming out of Egypt, like somebody, God took him out of Egypt with the strength of his loftiness in accordance with the power of his loftiness. The height, similarly. Abundant of silver, they 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 are terms denoting strength. So the concept is uh or oh, is next to the time attain that the office in turn that is similar to the phrase and let the birds fly, which makes something flying to a lofty heights, expressing great power. 
Thus, Kisayf Israel means flying high. Another interpretation of Safari means the power of Re'emim. And our rabbis say that refers to demons. We can learn the verse 23, we can learn Lachash B'Yakev, for there's no deviation in, in Jacob, for the Kesem Yisrael, no soothing saying in, in, in Israel. Time to that we said about Jacob, Israel, and to the Jewish about the Jewish people, Mapael, what has God brought? They are worthy of blessings since there are no diviners and so sayers amongst them. They don't go to witchcraft and sorcery like the like the nations of the world. They go to Mazalis and all this sorcery and all this stuff. Jewish people go straight to God. There will come another time like this when the love God has for them will be revealed to all and they will be seated before him and learn Torah from his mouth. So here again, he's prophesizing Mashiach. The place will be further in a close divine presence than the ministering angels. They will ask them, what has God wrought? This is the meaning of what is stated. Your eye shall behold your teacher. Come a time that will sit like by the table, will sit like, like, like princes on the table of the king. Another uh, interpretation, as she says, Yemuliyaka is not what the future tense shall be said about Jacob, but at the present tense. Thus the meaning is, they have no need for divine sources, diviners and sources. For any time it is necessary to tell Jacob and Israel what God has wrought and what decrees he has enacted on high, they do not need diviners or sources. But the decrees of the omnipresent are transmitted to them through their prophets. But through the Urim and Tumim and the Beis Amikdash, they don't need to have Bilams and Bullocks. They have the Beis Amikdash, they have God. So that's another expression. That not that the future is going to be told to Jacob, but right now. Onkelos, however, does not render it in this manner. Onkelos renders for the diviners do not wish that good should be bestowed upon Jacob, nor do the soothsayers desire the greatness of Israel. At this time, it will be told to Jacob abroad what God has wrought. Verse 23, Haim of Kalavi Yakum, Ukariyas Nasser. Behold, a people that rises like a lioness and like raises itself like a lion. It does not lie down until it eats its prey. And drinks the blood of the slave. I love this verse. This is our logo, the Chabad logo, the lion. That's the name of When they awaken from their sleep in the morning, they show their vigor of a lioness and a lion in grasping mitzvahs. They stand up like a lion. That's what it says in the Shukhanara. Tom Kari, stand up like a lion. They grab the talus and they put on the talus. Look at the Jewish people. They wake up in the morning to run to show. But Yishka Balayla, he does not lie down. A Jew does not lie down on his bed at night until he consumes and, and destroys any harmful things that come to tear him. How does he do that? How does the Jew destroy everything? He recites the Shema on his bed and entrusts the spirit in the hand of God. Should any harm or truth come to harm him, the Holy One blessed be, he protects him. He says, Be I put my trust in the Kaddish Baruch. Hu. I put my spirit in the Abish that I'm not to be afraid of. He protects them, fights their battles, and strikes their attackers down dead. Another interpretation, behold the people that rise like a lioness, as the tiger of Uncle Svenzer, namely, it will not settle its land until it destroys an enemy and takes possession of the land of nations. He's going to be like a lion who doesn't stop until it devours his enemy. Dam Chalalam Yishta and drinks the blood of the slain, prophesies that Moshe would not die until it would strike down the Midianite king dead. And he, Bilam, would be slain with them. 
and it says Bilam the son of Ber, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword with those that they were slain with by them. So later on he prophesies that he's going, they're going to, they're ultimately going to destroy us and I'm going to be in the midst of the dead. Verse 25, You know what? Don't curse them. Please don't bless them. Don't no, thank you and no thank you. Verse 26, by Yam Bilam, and Bilam answered Balak and he said, I have told you. Call Lamer saying, Call Ashayidah, but Hashem, I already told you whatever God told me to say, that's what I will do. He completes the Chumash of today. What a powerful, powerful Chumash. Okay, we're going to the Tanya of the day. Today is the 14th day of Tammuz. Dr. Rebbe, we're holding in chapter 4 of Igeras Hachuva. And the Alter Rebbe now talks about, he asked a question. We ended off yesterday with a powerful power question that how do you reconcile the, uh, the, the, the punishments of the Torah? We can stand. There's no death penalty anymore in the Jewish nation because you don't have a Sanhedrin. So the regular death penalty, we don't have the power anymore, and we don't, uh, we're not involved anymore in life and death issues of Torah law. If somebody kills somebody, or somebody does these kind of things that are punished by death, it's not in Jewish courts. It goes to non-Jewish courts, and that has happened since the Chumash and even this, in the end of the Second Temple. But uh, what about this, all the punishment the Torah tells that God says He's going to punish people? And God says that if a person he do, does certain kind of sins, he's going to give him kares, or he's going to, he's going to die, he's going to be severe shamayim, death in heaven. And we see people living for years and years and years, and we might even know that they have sinned, they've done the sins of the Torah, and the Torah says that are punishable by this death, and they're living a long life. The answer that answers this on Pekabola. It's a very difficult question. Alter Rebbe says, the answer according to Hasidus is as follows. The key to this we found in the phrase for God's people are part of God. It's a very powerful verse. So we're going to go down to where the verse is written. Deuteronomy. Okay, it's a verse in the title. <laughs> for God's people are part of God. That's actually, if you, you remember this word, the beginning of Tanya. The chalik, the, the Shama is a chalik, a chalik, my Shama is a chalik. So chalik, a part of God. Chalik, what does that mean? When it says, Ki chalik Hashem amai, that a, a part of God's people are part of God. Ki chalik mishem havaya baruchu. They are part of the four letters of the name of God. So that the makeup of a Jew is, is the Eivishter, because it's God. Because God, in, 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 in his, the name of God, the tetragram, yud ke vav the, the, the DNA of every soul is made out of this name of God. Can you see, as the verse says, that the, that the Eivishter blew within him a soul, a, a, a soul of life. So it man enough for metafina. This is all in chapter two of Tanya, and the Zoya comments. He who blows blows does it from within him. So God took, so to say, from within him. He took the name of God and he blew it within a human being. He gave him a breath of life. So the metaphor of blowing signifies the soul of a Jew originates in the innermost aspect of God, in the tetragram, in the name of God, Yud Kevavke. And it, it came into a, into a human being. Even though God is kind of God blue human being, this all expression, human expressions, you cannot put a human expression in God. But as we express this many times, the Gemara says, now the Torah says it again, the Torah speaks like the language of man. So when the, we understand that when I take a deep breath, 
I'm taking from the breath from within me and blowing it out. So to God, took so to say, he took a deep breath, so to say. For analogy, there exists a vast difference in the case of a mortal man between the breath issuing from his mouth. We all breathe. Yeah, you can't speak. You can't speak without breath. Also, uh, expression of of, of 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 breath, and then to throw taking a deep breath. When his breath comes out and speaking, it's almost like you don't you don't feel that it it, it, it comes out. That's some people lose their <laughs> they talk so much they lose their breath, but in general it's easy to to to, to speak. Because it's not a very, it's not a lot of breath that is used to be able to speak. It's only a, a super, superficial aspect of the soul that dwells within him. That's why Sodom and Maris in general says that the Abish created the world through speech. So it explains that the reason why it's expressed in that way is because it was done externally. It was chitzonius. That's why the world is chitzonius. The world is an outer force. The, 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 it's a shell. It's a. It's a. It's seemingly a clipper. Even it could be. A, it could be a shell. It can be a covering. It can be the opposite of holiness because it's chutzenis. Because it comes from an outer expression, speech. When a breath comes from the essence, I take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Like it, that person is catching his breath. And it comes from his, it comes from his guts. This embodies the internal power of life. For us, the vivifying soul gets like he's catching his breath, holding on to his last breath. So that shows in a much more inner aspect of the, the, the life force of a human being, that we live off of the breath. We live off air. We live off of breathing. So that's the namashal. So when the God wanted to express the difference between the creation of the world and the creation of man, he gave that analogy that we can understand. He said, I created the world through speech, and I created the soul of man through my breath. Oh, so too, the analogy, it's only an analogy of creation allowing infinite, the creation involved between the created and the created, yeah, there exists an you know, unbelievable amount of difference above. Then calls for Shamayim. There's no there's, there's a great difference between creation, even the creation of the spiritual beings, the, the angels. Everything was created from nothing to something. They all derive their life force. From external aspects of the life force issuing from the fourth into the one who vitalizes creation. It's all chitzonius. The Kabbalah says, it's based on the Zoya, that everything in the creation, whether it's the angels, the upper worlds, especially this world, is all created through speech. And therefore, it's all created chitzonius. It's all, a, it's all an outer force. One means an outer force, it means it's not for the essence. There's something that it's there for. Everything in creation is there for something. That's the difference. I'm saying this is one of the differences between what something, what, when, it, when the physicist says, Chitzainis, you're, you're an outer concept, you're an inner concept. An inner concept is there for itself, not there for something else. It has its own identity. And an outer concept is there for something else. Like a vessel, so the outer council, like a vessel. It's there for something else. The vessel is not needed. If you, if you don't need the cup, if you don't have water, what's going to be the worth of the cup without the water? That's what they put in. Well, the cup's value is, is, is that it contains, again, it holds water. If there's no, no, there's no water, what are you going to have a cup for? So it's a double thing. It's not there for itself. Everything in the world is there for something else. Besides, on the shovel. The soul is there for itself. Taylor is there for itself. So the God is there for itself. That's the connection between Taylor, God, 
and then a shun. This external aspect of life giving power is called the breath of his mouth. It says also by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. What is the meaning? It means created by the breath of God. Because everything comes from the essence of God. But the difference is, everything in the world was created with ten utterances. So it's the breath of God. Everything is created by God, but it's the breath of God, that's the way it's clothed in the ten utterances of God, which is through speech. All these letters is the vessels, the nature of the vessels, which is So you have to go back to the beginning of Tanya. Without the Rebbe, explains this, that there's concept of oil, and 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 clean. So everything was created in the world through vessels, through oasis. That's why it was the world was created through te, through to the oasis, to the letters. It's part of my mothers, ten utterances. And as the, we explained in the Ramam in the Tanya before, with the mixing of the letters and all the multiple ways of com combining the letters and the medical vowels. Because the letters are the are the vessel. Which everything in the world was created. But that's not the way God created the soul. Nishmas Adam, when God created the soul of man, was not created through words. That's the power of the soul. The soul was created through the breath of God. No vessels. The soul came from Pnimi to Pnimi. The soul came from the from the Pnimi Sakodesh Baruch. And that's why the soul, that's the power of the soul. That's why we understand the power of the soul in general. The soul of man derives initially from the innermost dimension of the life force that flows issuing from the infinite one from the end saber. By Shekosov, as the verse says, by Yipach blew. So that's the way Kabbalah, it's a very deep concept with Kabbalah because because ultimately a soul is also a created entity. But there's a vast difference between the creation of everything in the world, even the angels and the upper world, the spiritual world, that were created through also through the ten my mothers, ten, ten, ten expressions of God, ten expressions of God, all the heavens and everything that was in it that was created through our Sodom and through speech. While the Abish created our Neshama through breath, who is in the most aspect. And that's why it's saying that we have the capability to reach Atmos. Only a human being has the capability to reach the essence. Nothing in the world, not even the angels, nothing in the world has that power because nothing in the world has the capability. Everything was created through Chitzainis and therefore cannot reach higher than that. We are not created. Our body was created through that, but our soul was created through Nima Sakodeshwa, the essence of God. That's what Al Kadeb says in the beginning of the second back chapter of Tanya. Khelek Hashem Jisro, who Khelek Abaya Mamish, the fire of a Kodesh. Pimis, that means a part of Pimis. And then it descended from more concealing planes. Also, ultimately, it came into man. The soul came into man. And man, the physical side of him, is creation. The Torah says, through the words of God, not something, let us make man. In order that it could eventually invest in the body in this inferior physical world. So this then is the difference between the soul and angels. Souls derive from the innermost aspect of godliness. The tetragrammaton, while the angels are rooted in the external aspect of godliness, divine name Malakim, as explained now. And that's why in the reason in the scripture, you, God, the you, you, angels are expressed in the name of God, Elikim. 
which gossip, as the faith says, the Lord, your God is the God of all the The last word referred to angels. Praise the God, the God of Lakim, once again referred to angels. An expression of Torah itself, the sons of God, Elikim, which Rashi says it means the angels, the staff is presented itself before God. So we see that the angels are called Elikim in the title. Humans are also sometimes expressed to Elikim that when it comes to, to a court, it says they come before Elikim. And that's before the court of people. See, Elikim is used. The word Elikim is, is used for angels. Sometimes it's used for humans also. Because they derive their nature from an external degree of godliness, which is merely a merely a state of letters. So everything in the world is a state of letters. They all come together through the letters of Akonish Baruch. It's all made up of numbers. If you're a mathematician, if you're a computer. <laughs> Yeah, everything is made up of numbers. Everything is made up of letters. The data, everything is exceeded to Kabbalah, everything is made up of the Asana of the, of the, of the, of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. As we explained in the, in, in the, in the previous teachings of Zatanya. Shem Lekim, Shem and Shem Lekim, which is the second, that's the name of God, Lekim, is, is the name of God of nature, is is not is, is it's chitzonis is an outer expression in comparison to the name of God Yud K Vav K. Vish Adam, but the soul of man, Shitachin is Pnimis Achayes, which is the internal aspect of the God's vivifying power. It goes to the essence of God. He fey like Shem Avaya, but who comes from the youth K Vav K of God name? He Shem Avaya because the Tetragram Yud Hey Vav Hey. Mada Pnimis Achayes indicates the innermost dimension of of the life life force of God. She lemaila maila bechinis, which is much higher than the letters, because that that is the oil, and that's the best. There's no comparison between the 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 the, 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 the primis and chetzaynis. There's no comparison between the two entities. And therefore, when the Torah wants to express the power of a human being in its creation and its purpose, the Torah expresses itself in this way: that a, that the world was created through speech, while the soul soul of man, not the not the body of man. So in, 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 in that you see the difference that the physicist explains that there's a big difference between the rest of the world and in human being, and even that, the animal, et cetera. That everything was created through speech, everything. Then you said, let a cow come out, and a cow came out of the ground. That means a cow also had a soul, but a cow's soul and its body is one entity. They both come out of the creation of God's speech. God created man. He created two different entities. He created his body. We said like 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 he created a cow. Let there be a cow. Let there be animals. So he created the body. Also, says Nas Adam. Let's make man through speech. Then of And if he created the body, he blew he blew within him a breath of life. That means the soul of man. Is much higher than everything else in creation. The soul of man comes from the breath of God. Which, is, which the Torah says, what does that mean? When you say the breath, it comes from its essence. When God doesn't have, doesn't have breath or doesn't have, it's just an expression. When God says, I took from my breath, it's like speech. Speech is also is just an analogy. So the analogy between speech and breath. Speech is an outer expression. Breath is what I, what I live on. I take my breath, which makes expression, my last breath. I took his last breath. That's 
some people express that the expression of of, of King Solomon, Kov Hela Hevel Avolim. So the simple translation: everything is vanity, but really the translation is all but a breath. Hevel, Avolim. It's all but a breath. It's a breath goes into your essence. Take a deep breath. Abish took so to say today so the way God wants to express Himself that a person would realize the difference between an ashrama and his goof, the difference between his body and his soul. His body was created through speech, which is which even the even the and that's a lofty thing because everything in creation was created through speech, and even the angels were created through speech. But his neshama, his life force, created through the breath of God much more deeper inner aspect than an outer concept of speech. We didn't get to the answer yet of the Alta Rebbe, but this is the end of the Tanya of the day. Completes the Tanya. And we'll continue tomorrow, Bezat Hashem. Today is the 14th day of the month of Tammuz, my friends. And, um, and uh, the Tillam for today is chapter 72. 82, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76. So 72 to 76. Those are the chapters of Tanya, and you would have completed the Tanya, the film of the day. And by doing that, you completed the chitas of the day. I wish you all a great day, a happy day, a healthy day, a wonderful day. Say a little bit more till him today. There was a great tragedy in, uh, in, in Bell Harbor. And this jar of building fell down, and they are missing uh, there some Jews also. Mm -hmm. I say a little bit to them for those people. Maybe she should be, uh, they should be found and healthy and well. And it should be good for everybody and happiness and joy in the world. I wish you all a wonderful, beautiful day. See you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn. I want to just announce that I, uh, the, the Fabrengen on, 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 on you've been time inspired me. And I'm going to start on Sunday the class, Shara B'Tochen, the fourth degree of trust from the Chavis Alavavis. It's the fourth that we all come and learn this. And have a little bit more faith, trust in our Baruch Hu, that ever would always tell people when they're going through issues, emotionally, physically, whatever issue in life, they should learn Shara B'Tochen. So I think it's time to do that. We're going to take a, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to the Sunday mornings, we'll it's not such a long uh, learning. It's like six chapters. We will uh, do it over the next couple of weeks. And then we'll go back to the Tanya on Sunday. So I'm inviting everybody over to Chabad at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And uh, we'll learn together. We'll learn how to have trust and inspire each other to have trust and to have a Muna, to have faith and trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And um, go from there. Let's hope we'll all have a beautiful and wonderful night. Sounds great. Hey, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Hi, Karen. Hi, Mo. Hi, Sarah. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Have a good day.